Hello, and welcome back. My name is Dr. Christopher Janari, and this is Great Big History Podcast. In our continued series in History 102, we do the Great Depression, the death of laissez-faire capitalism, and the crisis of the modern world. So the 1930s gives us the Great Depression and the death of the tra traditional order. So buckle in, guys and gals. It's going to be a bumpy ride for the next bunch of episodes. Traditional kings and emperors are deposed, and re the republics that replace them are messy. Greece kills their king, Spain overthrows their king, Italy gets fascism. Ireland revolts against Britain, gets its own country, but not an entire island of its own country. Germany overthrows its king, eventually gets Nazism. Austria breaks into five states. Hungary loses 60% of its population, 3.3 million people. Austria eventually gets Nazism. Russia gets the Communist Revolution and the USSR, and Mexico has revolution, civil war, and a USA border war. So things are a mess. The economic crisis of the 20s, Spanish flu, the depression in the 20s, hyperinflation equals wealth plus success equals credit. There's not a lot of liquidity. There's not a lot of cash. So both individually and nations are living on credit. Monarchies are dead. Liberal ca democratic capitalism is shaky. Communism looks good. After a shaky start, it has coalesced in the 20s and is growing in the 30s when everyone else is falling apart. It's liberal new world order on the move. It is a change in the economic and political world. And those who are looking for change who don't understand or don't know, I shouldn't say understand, they just don't know what's going on within the USSR. Look at it and say, this is something new. This is good. This is a finally we're getting a change. Meanwhile, fascism is conservative reactionary response to communism and what is perceived as the soft weakness of democracy. So the Great Depression from 1929 to 1940 is the death of laissez-faire capitalism. Capitalism, quote-unquote capitalism, that we have been talking about is dead. It died in 1929. You have to understand, you do not live in a capitalist, quote-unquote, world. We'll talk about what you do live in, but the idea of capitalism, as the inventors of capitalism created, as like Adam Smith wrote about, doesn't exist. You don't live in that world. It died in 1929. It imploded. It murdered itself. Which is what Marx always said was going to happen. Empires could no longer pay for themselves. The USA was rich, but everywhere else was bankrupt because of World War I. C. Fitzgerald, Gertrude Stein, Hemingway, they're all living in Paris. Why? Because the American dollar could buy you so much more in France. America was rich, but the world was poor. Britain and France owed the USA lots of money. Germany owed Britain and France war reparations. So the United States paid Germany to pay the UK and France to pay back the USA, which is circular credit, which is a problem if anything bad ever happens. It works fine if the money keeps circulating and everyone's paying back each other with the same money. That works fine as long as nothing bad happens. Well, our section's called the Great Depression, so we know something bad is going to happen. The 20 sort easy credit. Consumerism for individuals. It's the first advertising age. The biggest sports store of the age, Babe Ruth, was also the biggest seller of products. He was the biggest ad man of products. He sold everything from children's cereal to, to cigarettes. The stock market increased 400%. There's a graphic on the bottom left if you're watching the video. It just keeps going up and it's going up and it's going up and it's going up throughout the decade. But all of that up is all based on credit. It's not based on actuality. It's not based on the making of money by companies. It's not, make, it's not based on the making of money by the society or more people buying in. It's all based on credit. People taking out loans and using that money 
to put into the stock market because you can make more in the stock market than you paid on the loan. See, if you take the money out at 5%, but the stock market goes up 15%, you've made 10%. The 5% loan minus the 15% gain, you've made 10% essentially for free. That's great as long as nothing bad happens. All of this credit gets us to jazz age, which is fun and it's an urban life and it's on credit. But it also gets us rural debt, farming mechanization on credit. Farmers could buy more land. Farmers could buy more machines, tractors. They could go from the horse and the oxen pulling things to the car. The Model T was actually retrofitted so that it could be, it could be a tractor or could work as a cheap tractor. But if you, but then you needed to farm more land and be more efficient in order to pay off the, the mechanization. And this is going to be a cycle that gets us Willie Nelson in the eighties and the nineties called farm aid, where it's like, uh, before you had Kickstarter, it was a Kickstarter for farmers because the constant need for mechanization and industrialization and farming equaled rural debt again. So we've got this fun, jazzy, vaguely homosexual world, and especially in Weimar Republic, homosexuality is, is kind of open and liberal. So you've got this kind of liberal urban world. The rural world is still going to be very, very conservative, but it's all living on credit. It's all living on credit cards. And that's fine as long as nothing bad happens. Well, you know something bad is going to happen. You know the worst economic crisis in the history of uh, the United States happens. And it starts in October 1929 when the stock market implodes, though that implosion is going to follow the crash of London's stock market in September and a farming debt crisis we just kind of talked about. Farmers start going bankrupt in 1928 because there's a series of droughts. We'll talk about that later. So you have a complete credit implosion in October of 1929, starting in October of 1929. That's C-2007-2008. Those of you who are old enough to remember that, the end of the Bush years, the start of the Obama years, that is, it is, the ex it is not the exact same thing, but it is a credit crisis. The implosion of the mortgages wrecked the banks and that wrecking the banks wrecked the financial credit institutions so that no one could borrow anymore. And the problem is modern quote capitalism is all based on borrowing. It's based on short, short term liquidity is all based on credit. Like think about you. I, I mean, I don't know how you survived the, the quarantine. I did it and I almost, I still had uh, right when the quarantine started in March of 2020, I took out 200 bucks and I said, if I need some spending cash, I got spending cash. I still have those $200 18 months later. Why did I not buy anything? No, I bought plenty of stuff. I bought food. I bought necessities. I bought some entertainment stuff. I bought stuff for work because now I had to work from home. So, you know, more microphones and, and recording equipment, editing equipment, some software, things like that. I bought a lot of that stuff. I used a credit card to do it I, on Amazon and other companies. I used a credit card. So I used credit. I didn't use cash. Could I have done that if I'm March uh, 15th? Two weeks into quarantine, my Visa card or American Express card called me up and said, you're done. You can't borrow anything anymore, which is what happened in 2007, 2008. So in 2007 or 8, credit had gone in crazy. It, 2007, 2006, 2007 looks like 1928 going into 1929. My American Express credit. Not what I paid, well, not what I spent, but my credit limit was something like forty thousand dollars, which was insane. 
to allow someone to borrow at 15%. There's no way if I borrowed, if I spent $40,000, I'd ever be able to repay that at 15% interest. Never. Right? And there are people who did. They, you know, made films on their credit cards and paid for everything on their credit cards and never paid it back or whatever happened. Or they lived on it after they lost their jobs in 2007 going into 2008. But when the credit implosion happened in 2007, all of a sudden I went from $40,000 to about $500 more than what I had, what my debit was, what I owed. So the number I owed, they cut me to 500 bucks above that. They just went plump. Because why? Because all suddenly the entire entire credit market imploded. The the places Visa and American Express get their money from wouldn't lend them any money, so they didn't want. They couldn't lend me money, even at fifteen percent. And they didn't want me to because so many people were going out of work. That they had to protect themselves, but they can't make my credit limit less than what I already owe. So they cut right down to the bone. And that's what happened in 1929. Everybody who needed money suddenly got locked out of it. Now, there's a major difference between 2007 and 1929. And that is, my bank was insured. So the money I had in the the bank remained liquid. It remained mine. I could still use it to buy stuff. So in 2007, 2008, suddenly I was living on cash for the first time since I was like a teenager or my, or in college, I suddenly had, you know, money in my pocket because I needed it because you couldn't use the credit cards anymore. You just put them away. I went, okay, that's done. Cause they wouldn't visa visa essentially shut down. They were trying not to go bankrupt. So you've seen, my point is if you are of a certain age, you have seen the 1929 implosion happen. And I remember living through 2006, 2007, 2008, and getting, staying up late enough after the London stock market went down 600 points, New York went down a thousand points. And then I was up late enough that I was like, Tokyo's about to open. What's going to, what's going to open Tokyo? And Tokyo was down a thousand or 1500 points. And it was day after day after day after day that the stock market just kept going down and down and down. I remember being in a coffee shop doing some grading. I was doing some grading and I went to a coffee shop. I, I took a table and a small little table out in a corner. It was the middle of the day, so it wasn't too busy. And some accountant was using the coffee, the coffee shop as his office. He either didn't want to, he either got kicked out of his office or didn't want to bring clients to his office. The clients would then talk to each other, I imagine, in the waiting room. So he's meeting them in the coffee shop. And I remember hearing this guy, you know, go, wait, I've lost $100,000. And the accountant goes, yes, the stock market's gone down. And that means you've, you're now down $100,000. And the guy went, but where did it go? And he's like, well, it's the stock market. It just lost value. And he's like, but I, I, can't, re- I can't retire. What am I supposed to do? And the accountant's like, nothing. You can't do anything. The stock is not worth it. If you sell the stock now, you cannot sell the stock. Nobody is buying it. It is worthless. And this guy was just like, but it's the stock market. It's got to be worth something. And it's like, no. And if I was smart, I would have offered him, and this is what smart people did in 1929 and in 2007, I would offer him $10,000 for everything. And he would have taken it. I was at $10,000 in cash, but you have to sign over all your stock because I am not near retirement. I was in my 30s. So I knew I had time for the stock market to recover. I, just like in 1929, I knew it will eventually recover unless there's a giant war, in which case money isn't worth anything. So who cares? And so I would have made a killing. 
because he would have sold because he had to sell. He needed, he needed liquidity. He needed cash. And I would have now owned something for the future that if it, when it recovered. So one of the weird things is millionaires, billionaires actually made money on the stock market crash because they kept buying, they kept doing that. They kept buying cheap stock. Now that's because they were millionaires or what we would call billionaires today. So they could live on their wealth, but poor people got wiped out. And that's what we're going to talk about. And this, this screen, if you're looking at it, this is going to explain. And that map, that graphic of where 1929 is, right? June, 1929, that peak. And then it's crashed and crashes and crashes and crashes and just keeps going down into this hole until 1932. This, this screen is the next half of the course. Everything we will talk about, holocausts, great wars, decolonization of the free market, uh, the UN, Everything that comes out of that happens in this course from this moment next is on this screen is because of this screen. Because right here, laissez faire capitalism, the capitalist system since since four since 1750, since at least Adam Smith has died. It died right there. You're watching it have a heart attack right on the screen. Boop, 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 boop. You're watching it. That's death. What you what you are looking at is the death of capitalism in that graphic. And what comes after it is an effing disaster. So how does this happen in October? The margin, you get margin calls. The banks start asking for payments on short term loans for investments. These happen all the time in cap in. And by this point you get, you have, you guys may not know this, but if you're in the financial world, you, you know, this easily, you have, you have 12 hour loans, you have one day loans, you have one week loans, you have one month loans. You've got loans for like businesses borrow lots of stuff and they need it for like a week. Uh, McDonald's may borrow a hundred million dollars to pay payroll, but they know they're going to get all of their money from their franchises a week later. So there's constantly this borrowing and paying car borrowing and paying, but very few companies have the liquidity, have the cash on hand. Well, what happened is the October margin calls caused a mass sell off so that people could make money to pay back the bank loans that they took. And October 24th, 4th, you get Black Thursday, where the stock market lost 11% of its value in one day. In one day. And October 28th, Black Monday, 12% of its value. So in two days, Thursday and Monday, it's lost, what, 23%. It's down a quarter. And then October 29th is the crash where everyone tried to get out. It lost another 12% and would not recover from this day for four years. So much volume. In fact, it's not going to recover for four years. The stock market doesn't go up for four years. Like you saw this, right? It's going to crash and beep, 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 and keep going down. So much volume was sold that the ticker which listed all the different stocks and its value was four hours behind, which means you couldn't make any decision. It meant there was so many people trying to sell to get out that this ticker. And if you were looking at the screen, there's an old fashioned ticker there with its ticker tape. But today we would have it on the screen, right on the bottom. It's, it's still called the ticker and it runs on the bottom and that runs 15 minutes behind. Normally, now imagine CNBC or MSNBC or CNBC or, um, you know, like Fox business is running their ticker and the ticker on the screen is four hours behind what you're not living in reality anymore. 
the future, you're living in the past. You can't make any decision. You're going to call up and say, sell Exxon for $30. And they're going to be like, $30, dude, it's eight bucks. And that's if you could get a guy on the phone in order to get him to sell. So in October 1929, the, the stock market was valued at 381 points. By July 1932, it was 40.59 points. Now, what does that mean? I, it's complicated and I don't really want to get into it. The point is, is that the value of the stock market had a, had a value that was 90% less in four years. The stock market did not reach 381, so it did not recover from the highs of October 1929 until 1954, 25 years later. The investor class is wiped out. When I said, remember when I said that laissez-faire capitalism died? You, that's the line, right? It doesn't recover for a generation. The stock market is wiped out for 25 years. The, the value of company, even though companies are going to make money, the value of their stock will not equal 1929 value, the height of 29 until 1954. People simply didn't want to invest in the stock market. The investor class is completely wiped out. But by wiping out the investor class, it wiped the banks out too because the investor class were the number one receiver of loans from the banks. Again, 2007, 2008, the stock market goes down. The investors can't pay back their loans. Lehman Brothers goes out. Goldman Sachs, almost goes out. The big banks, all big banks were essentially bankrupt. The entire economy was essentially bankrupt. Remember that by 2008, the government essentially owned the banks. The government had bailed out the banks and essentially owned them. Had the, had the, had the government wanted to fire all the CEOs, they could have. Merrill Lynch was bankrupt, had to sell itself. Several other, basically, the, all the major investor companies on Wall Street were wiped out. 90% of them. Goldman Sachs might have been the only one that still had any liquidity. And just because it's the biggest. So the banks are wiped out. 9,000 banks go out of business. And in rural places, you might only have one bank in an entire region, which means when it went out, it took the entire savings of southeastern Nebraska with it. This is one of those things that I, I've I, that when I, I don't get into fights with people over the depression, it's not really my field, but you get into people who talk and they talk like libertarians. The government shouldn't shouldn't, you know, in 1929, the government got involved. Well, of course they got involved. Because it's not New York City. You've lived in New York City where there's a bank on every every other block. In southeastern Nebraska in 1930, there's one bank. And so in rural places, if that one bank went out, it wiped out the entire savings of not just the town, but the entire region, the entire county. Why? Well, because there is no investment protections on banks. Banks were considered an investment. There's no FDIC. So you put your money into a bank in, in order to make a little bit of profit on it. But it was considered an investment. If, you, if the bank went under, you lost your money. So people lost their savings. It was this is where the stuffing it under your mattress or putting the cash into jars and putting them, you know, burying it in the backyard. This is where people did why people did that. Because they didn't trust the banks. There's a line in Hamilton with Jefferson is yelling at Hamilton and he's like, You represent the banks who are just trying to 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 fleece our farmers. They're looking for chips to cash in. So people lost their savings, which meant the run on the banks. Because if one bank went under, the people who had their money in the other bank suddenly were terrified that they would lose all of their savings. So they went to the bank and demanded their money out. But if they demanded their money out, that meant that bank might fail too because it didn't have the money. It loaned out the money. So it doesn't have the cash. 
So you get a run on the banks to get your savings out in order to pay bills, buy food, to be liquid. That caused a panic. More banks became insolvent, which means you get more runs and you get more bankruptcies. So it becomes self-fulfilling. Every time a bank goes out, people are terrified their bank will go out, which means they run to the bank to take out their money, which causes the bank to collapse, which then causes more people to run to go to their bank and boom, to the boom, to the boom, and it keeps going. So no credit equals the banks can't or won't loan money, which means no liquidity, no cash equals people can't pay for necessities, much less luxuries. Like you can't buy bread, much less French wine. You can see why this is now going to cause a depression. If you can't buy stuff, businesses can't sell. Plus businesses can't get credit to pay or keep employees or to pay or keep stock. Like when they buy, when Wegmans buys food to come in on Tuesday, they don't buy it in cash. They buy it on credit. Well, what if they can't get the credit? That means now they can't buy stock. So businesses start to close, which equals unemployment, but there's no unemployment insurance, which means people can't make money, which means people can't buy stuff, which means more businesses close and it goes on and it goes on and it goes on. This is what is called the depression cycle. Now, weirdly, I have a graphic up on the video and weirdly it starts with factories produce less. That's the weird place to start because the factories just don't start producing less. It starts with people losing their job. So in a consumer economy, people lose their jobs, which means they can't buy things, which means the stores go out of business, which means they stores do not order from factories, which means factories do not get order orders, which means factories produce less, which means now workers, not as many workers are needed, which means people lose their job and doomed. And remember the stores go out of business, which means more people lose their jobs. So there should be, this is not a very friendly to the worker graphic because there's like three different places where people lose their jobs should be added because in a consumer economy, which the United States has been for a very long time, the money is not made on production. It's made on people buying stuff. This is going to be a big deal as we go along in this class, because it's the number one kind of misrepresentation of what our economy is. There's a lot of obsession with making stuff, manufacturing, manufacturing jobs are down. Okay. But there are literally more childcare workers in the country than steel workers. There are more preschool teachers than there are coal workers. It's just one sector of the economy happens to be white and male and thus privileged. The other one happens to be female. And when you get into nurses or day or uh, care providers, care providing nurses, you get into minorities and immigrants and they're not privileged. But we live in a consumer, not producer economy. 75%, 80% of the U S economy is made by people buying stuff. That's why Amazon is one of the largest companies in the world. So each step of the cycle, this is the problem with the depression. Each step of the cycle reinforces the next step and reinforces the previous step. So people keep losing their jobs. They can't buy stuff. So the unemployed man becomes the symbol of the great depression. That's the thing that's photographed. That's the thing that's, that's pictured. That's, you know, the, I know three trades. I speak three languages. I fought for three years. I have three children. I have had no work for three months, but I only want one job. You know, there's a pictures of these guys who are wanted a decent job and their resume is on their chest. Wanted a decent job. I'm a family man by a decent family man, 37 family war veteran paying on home college trained native Chicagoan, meaning not an, not an immigrant, right? There's the, the march against starvation, right? That became the symbol of the thirties, the unemployed man and how to solve this problem, how to solve the problem of the unemployed man becomes the obsession of the rest of this course in a lot of ways. 
So, from 1929 to 1940, the death of laissez-faire capitalism, which is since 1500, but really it's seven, but since 1750. What we have is unemployment. In the United States, you have 25%. Germany, you have 40%. UK, you have 20%. But, 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 those are numbers you will see in every textbook, but they're incorrect because that's global numbers. It's much worse in certain locale, local locales and for certain groups. African Americans had 50% unemployment. In Atlanta, which is the blackest city in America in 1930, it was 70%. Right? This is Killer Mike's Atlanta. This is Atlanta Strong, all that kind of stuff. This is this is the the center of black urban life in America is Atlanta in 1930 and has 70 percent unemployment. It is wipes out black independent wealth. It's just wiped out. People who were able to build businesses to, to you know, African-American uh, men and women who were able to start businesses, sell to an African-American clientele. The very thing that Killer Mike's Netflix show is, is uh, abhors that doesn't exist. Well, it got wiped out in the Depression. And it will get continuously reduced afterwards. But the first great shot was here because they sold to these black businesses, sold to black clients. Well, the black clients no longer had jobs. So you didn't have the money to patronize the black businesses. And the black businesses, because America is systemically racist, didn't have access to the same amount of credit that white businesses did, which in the Depression didn't really matter because nobody had access to credit except the biggest, except the biggest firms. And the biggest firms are all white owned and on the stock market. So they have access to money and wealth that nobody, that, that the small business owner simply doesn't have. So they got wiped out. In rural U.S., in rural Europe, in places like Wales or, or in northern Scotland, it was 80% unemployment. Farming, the farming economy essentially imploded. It was simply done. Farmers were making food, but they couldn't afford the seed. They were selling their stuff at market to nobody because you couldn't buy. The whole system imploded. This causes a crisis of masculinity. You can't work. You can't feed your family. You can't, quote, provide, which was the definition of masculinity since the industrial age began. We can dif discuss whether it goes older than that. But at least within industrialization, the working man, the working class, middle class definition of masculinity was you worked, your wife didn't work, and you made enough money to feed, house, uh, clothe, and take care of. The basic 1950s uh, G Ward Cleaver definition, the father knows best definition of masculinity, um, the earliest definition, if you watched WandaVision, the earliest definition of how a man was supposed to act in those first two or three episodes is like, I'm going to take care of you, honey. Look, I'm going to be the, I'm going to go to work while you stay home. That, that starts in the 1820s, 30s or so. Why? Because industrial work, as we talked about, sucks and people didn't want their wives to do it. They didn't want their kids to do it. So you made it, quote unquote, as a man when your wife and children didn't have to go to work. And then you voted for the Labor Party or Labor Parties, quote unquote, depending on where you are, to pass laws to raise your income enough so that you're and to and to take your children out of the workplace so you could put them into education so that you didn't have to do that at all. So the question, if you can't do this basic form of masculinity, right? You can't work, you can't feed your family, you can't provide for your wife and kids. What use are you as a man? And this is a, this is a crisis of masculinity we still haven't recovered from. And we still don't know what to do. Because as I talked about in the 50s, we're going to reconstitute masculinity around that older form of masculinity of, of male as breadwinner, as provider. And so you still get that today. 
What use is a man if he can't have a job and take care of his wife and family? Well, you get welfare, but it's mostly private charity. It's not the government, which means you get the bread line, you get the soup line, you get free food, you get nourishment, you get subsistence. It's the idea that unemployed people shouldn't starve. Children shouldn't be, shouldn't suffer. You should understand if you have, you know this, if you took my one-on-one course, but if you haven't taken my one-on-one course, this is what welfare looked like in the Roman Republic 2,000 years earlier. It was food and subsistence, but no dignity. And you should also know the Roman Republic was overthrown by elites like Caesar who hired private armies trading dignity for loyalty. So this crisis of masculinity brought on by the implosion of independent work and the creation of subsistence welfare is a crisis of legitimacy for democratic governments. It destroyed the Roman Republic. It's going to destroy European governments as well. It destroys Herbert Hoover completely. Herbert Hoover, to historians, is now considered one of the worst presidents. He might be one of the smartest presidents who was ever elected. He's now considered one of the worst presidents we've ever had. So it's a crisis. And you can see this in our images. We have unemployed, a giant long line, free coffee, free donuts for the unemployed. Right? And that's a giant line. How do they have that much donuts? How do they have that much coffee? But you have, in our comic, bread lines, which lead to despair. Or picket lines. Fight your business. Fight your your company. Fight the government. Leading to prosperity. Well, that's a crisis of legitimacy for the government. Because if your citizens are protesting their businesses, their workplaces, their employers, their own government to do something, that's what imploded the French government and caused the French Revolution. The French government, the French king's inability to deal with the crisis of the French peasantry, to deal with a uh, famine. And it imploded the entire, and remember, two years later, all the rich people have their heads cut off. It's bad for rich people. It's bad for the king. The king is dead. The king's son is dead. The king's wife is dead. So this crisis of masculinity, this crisis of welfare, that you have enough to subsist on but no dignity, is a crisis in government. And it always has been. It has been since the Roman Republic. So what is the solution to the unemployed working man? Well, we're going to talk about four. One, the traditional laissez-faire, rugged individualism tradition. I.e., we're going to keep on trucking. What was good in the teens is good in the 20s. What's good in the 20s will be good in the 30s. Laissez-faire capitalism, rugged individualism. Now, you know how that's going to work because I've already told you it's the death of laissez-faire capitalism, but... This is the center right. In terms of government, this is the center right. This is the conservative, but not super conservative, part of the spectrum. This is, I don't even know anymore who would be center right these days. I mean, the closest the closest you get is like Olympia Snow, um, maybe Mitt Romney, but Mitt Romney's way conservative culturally. But economically, he, he'd be sent to right. Um, uh, Lisa Murkowski, you know, that's sent to right, I guess. Um, John McCain, before he died in the earlier days, you know, clearly center, uh, clearly a conservative, but, you know, not, not, not a super, super conservative. You know, um, and so the that's number one. Number one is we basically don't change. Number two is going to be social welfare slash Keynesian economics. This is the center left. This is um, 
uh, Bernie Sanders. Uh, this is r- very much um, um, Elizabeth Warren. So this now you may say today it tells you how far to the right America has moved that I have a tough time finding names that are really truly center right. Um, and the names I come up for center left, you have heard be called lefties, liberals, like they're way on the left. Like Bernie Sanders is, is all the way on the left. No, he's actually not. He's basically a center left kind of guy, right? That center left does extend from Bernie Sanders to Joe Biden. Joe Biden might even, Joe Biden might be a center right kind of guy. Hillary Clinton is a good center right kind of person, to be honest with you. In terms of like economics. Then we have communism and that is the left. That is very liberal. That is all the way to the left. And then you have fascism, which is all the way to the right. And Bernie Sanders may talk about socialism. He's not even remotely on within spitting, uh, within hailing distance, within spitting distance, within flagging distance. Within, he can't even wave to communism. But we're increasingly seeing in America people on the right who are hanging out with white supremacists, who are hanging out with fascists. It is very conservative. That's fascism. Fascism is as conservative as you can get. There is no to the right of fascism. And this is the fight. This is the basic fight. This fight between these four things, one, two, three, and four, is the basic fight we're talking about up till today of the next hundred years. And it will be the topic of the rest of this course. I'm going to tell you that the winner is number two. We're going to, I'm going to spoil it right now. I know you were like, spoilers, but I'm going to tell you it's number two right now. It's going to be the social welfare Keynesian economic state. How do how can I tell you that? Because the government gave you fifteen hundred bucks three different times during the pandemic to help you spend money. It put in bills against uh, it extended unemployment. It gave extra money to unemployment. If you were unemployed, you got extra money. Um, you couldn't get evicted. You couldn't get kicked out during the pandemic, and uh, businesses got a shit ton of money. So, no, even though America is to the right of every other country in the uh, OECD, the advanced industrial countries, like Germany and France just paid people to stay home. They just paid people stay home. Like we didn't go that far, but Germany and France did. They're like, no, 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 stay home. We we don't want you. I love the German commercials. The German commercials actually talk about... um, Daddy, what did you do in the great in the great pandemic? What did you what did you do? And it's like these kids looking up at their granddad, granddad, and it's a it's a it's a play on a World War One ad, which is what which is Daddy, what did you do during the war? And the dad is looking at you, he's breaking the fourth wall, going, Oh, which can say either one, I didn't fight and I now have to tell my kids I was a coward, or I did fight and I saw some scary ass stuff. And I don't really want to tell you what I saw. It really depends on how you want to look at it. Since it's a World War One ad, it really meant number one. But after World War One, it really means number two. So it really depends on what your perspective is. But there's German, these German ads taking granddad, what did you during the do the pandemic? And his answer is nothing. Nothing. I stayed home. We flattened the curve. We made sure the hospitals didn't get overrun. And how did he, how did that happen? The, the German government paid you 80% right off the top of your wage to make sure you still could buy stuff to keep the economy going, but to stay home. So you didn't spread the pan, the, the disease, you didn't spread COVID. So that's the world we live in. The winner is number two. The win- winner is Keynesian economics. Just l- just read anything by by uh, Paul Krugman, and you'll get the victory of Keynesian economics. We bailed out the banks in two thousand seven. That's Keynesian economics. Everyone's talking about infrastructure, infrastructure, infrastructure. Keynesian economics. So the winner is number two. 
But that fight, the fight between those four things will kill 100 to 200 million people between 1930 and 1990. It will create the Shoah, also known as the Holocaust. It will threaten nuclear annihilation. It will implode India. It will starve millions in China. It will let loose militant Islam. It will cook the planet with global warming and mass industrialization. But it will also create the modern welfare state and the idea of human rights. And the idea that government and the economy should work for people instead of the other way around. The idea that government serves the people, the idea that the economy works to help the people rather than people work for a company to improve the company, which is how laissez-faire capitalism works. In laissez-faire capitalism works, you work to make the company richer and in exchange, you get a wage. In Keynesian economics and social welfare economics, the care is that the economy needs to work for the people. There needs to be enough jobs for the people. There needs to be enough stuff for the people. There needs to be enough housing for the people. That's a major change from 1890, from 1900, and how economics works. <sighs> so I'm ending with puppies, and we are going to see a lot of puppies. I'm going to tell you right now, in the next couple of lectures, we're seeing a bunch of puppies. Why? Because puppies are fun. And a lot of this class stuff isn't. I mean, we just talked about killing 100 million people. So thank you, and I'm sorry. Be careful. I'm going to leave the puppies up for a little while so you can look. But take care.